the turning point uh, of your life was what changed the way you relate to others and the world? Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, I would say again, a big turning point was that that experience with my mom and that incredible uh, journey that I went on with her because basically I I looked her in the eye and just said, look, we're not going to mince words about this. Like, this is the thing that's going to kill you. Whether it kills you tomorrow, next week, a year from now, 10 years from now, you know, can't, cancer is going to be the thing that kills you. And so let's just not, let's just not pretend. Let's be, let's be really, you know, radically honest about it and orient our life in that way so that you make the most of every minute that you get. And um, that was an amazing experience. And luckily for me, my mom said yes, you know, mm-hmm. and wanted to go on that spiritual journey, basically, of really, you know, being present and living her life to the fullest. And I guess what, um, what really changed the way I see the world is this realization that, you know, being so honest and so in touch with death, our culture is super scared of that. But if you can do that, if you can get yourself to that place or you're thrust into that place, (laughs) however you get to, however you get there, it's when you talk about death, you're really talking about life. And so if you can face it and, and face that fear and stay with it and, and see it and, and start to not, not even experience it as fear anymore, it just gives you a whole other um, ability to create your life in a way that's so much more meaningful and so much more aligned. Um, so that's, you know, I started writing songs. Uh, I could just say right at this point that I I had to put down my guitar, but I always like, was like, you know, noticing things through this experience with her that I was like, oh, I'd love to write, uh, you know, that would be such a good song or just, just things I wanted to keep track of that the way she was changing or the way I was changing or the experiences we were having. So I would write them down in a notebook because yeah. I, yeah, because I couldn't um, stop and write a song right then. So uh, eventually she, she went into a big remission and I got some time away to, and I started, I pulled out that notebook and started writing songs. And, you know, this was, then it was a little bit of fit and start. So she'd go into a remission and I'd get a chance to do some, you know, go somewhere else and work on some music. But then she, of course the cancer would come back and it was like that until she died basically. Um, and then I really got to work on all these songs and these ideas and these things I was feeling. So that really changed my um, of course, the course of my musical career, because then I spent the last three or four years writing this record that's all about death. But it's not a downer. <laughs> like it's it, it's it's a, it's music that's all about our journey, but it's not a downer. Hobbies, mm. patience, pastimes. <laughs> um, well, I've already talked about backpacking and hiking. So that's a big hobby of mine. Um, I love, I'm obviously I was a major athlete and throughout all of my life until about age 22. I mean, I was playing competitive sports at a very, very high level. So that's still inside me. I still work out and, um, push myself in that, in that regard. It's just kind of who I am. Um, so there's not a day goes by when I'm not working out at at a relatively high level right now, my current uh, hobby is trying to get a. I've gotten really into gymnastics in the last couple of years. Mm. Um, yeah, not like on, uh, you know, the pommel horse or on the rings or anything like that, or not not equipment based gymnastics, but more like um, movement based gymnastics and body weight gymnastics. And so now my big obsession is trying to get a freestanding handstand in the middle of the room. <laughs> um, it's really, it's crazily hard. I, I'm, I, it's so humbling. That's what I say to my coach every day. I'm like, this, this is so, unbe- so unbelievably humbling. 
I, I can't even, I mean, I'm in better shape now than I was when I was playing two division one sports, like easily just because of the amount of core strength you have to have. And so that's really fun. Um, I love that. I do a lot of that. Um, and it, it's my, it helps me balance out my brain too. It's how I work out my stress. <laughs> um, and I love writing letters, the lost art of letter writing. I, as I said, I grew up, grew up at a time before all this, all these ways of communicating that were so instant. So my whole family wrote letters. My mom was, a, had a big family and we all wrote letters to our niece, our aunts and uncles. And, um, this is something I did, did it to my camp friends. You know, I did it to my college friends. We all wrote letters and I still love writing letters. I mean, hardly anybody writes me back, but, um, I love the, I love the whole process of writing letters. You know, the, the, the moment you create in your life to sit down and write a letter and stop and pause and the paper and the pen and the stamp and the whole mystery of a letter. Like I drop it in this box and then somehow five days later, it ends up in California at my partner's house. You know, all that stuff is just to me, just so wonderful and amazing. So I love writing letters. I do a lot of it. And um, I think the other thing is just trying to be a good friend. I mean, that's a big pastime of mine. I, I really spend a lot of time thinking about what it is to be a good friend and how, how one shows up for other people, you know, especially the inner circle of friends, but also the outer circle too, you know, kind of, I'm very fascinated by, by friendship, you know, how, how do friendships, how are they maintained over long periods of time? And how come you can be friends with someone and not see them for seven years or 10 years. But then when you see them, it's like, no, nothing's changed, you know? And then there's friends where that's not true at all. So I love, I love thinking about that kind of thing. And reading, reading's a big pastime of mine. Who, what do you reread? <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'm a big rereader. That's why I, I changed your question a little bit. Okay. Um, okay. I love rereading books. So like I said, I'm never not reading There Is Nothing Wrong With You by Sherry Huber. Um, but uh, I also, another book that I'm never not reading is a book, is a novel called Mating by Norman Rush. Uh, came out in the 90s, I believe. Won the National Book Award. It's a novel. I love it. I love it so much. I, I'm literally never not reading it. Um, it it's a joke. Hey. Mating. Yeah, mating. Yeah, um, it's a joke between me and my partner. She's just okay. can't believe that I'm never that mm -hmm. I'm reading it over and over again. But it, I don't know. There's something about it. There's the voice and the narrator and the way it's she talks is just uh, it just it's just amazing to me. So I'm 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 always reading that. I'm always reading Middle March. I read Middle March by George Eliot once a year. Okay. Um, which I love. And what's amazing to me about rereading that book is that I forget so much of it during the, over the, I mean, I do read it every year, but in between, so it usually takes me about a month or so to read it. It's pretty, pretty long. I forget so much about what happens in those, you know, 11 months that I'm not reading it. So I love that experience of remembering part of the plot that I've forgotten and being like, Oh yeah, that's a, that's amazing. And just marveling at how memory works. Um, I'm always reading Shakespeare. There's mystery and wonder and awe and in the way it fills your soul. I mean, you know, it That's speaks true. to you in some way. And you can't even explain why, but you just have to, you have to stay in touch with it. You wanted people to be in the moment with the first thing they thought of you. What's the very <laughs> last thing you want? people to think of when they think of you well basically the same answer um that you know i don't i don't want them to be thinking about me i want them to be in the in the moment and be present um you know if if they are to have any sort of uh residue of my <laughs> time with them um you know it was just that i made them feel seen and heard and understood 
and that they feel more like themselves. You know, that they, they feel more in touch with their own presence. So what is completely out of the question? Yeah. It's very hard for me to write a rhyme in a song that's as basic as moon, June, spoon. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so that's, that's out of the question. I mean, it's not, of course, but I'm, I struggle against, uh, I'm always trying to push myself with my songwriting. And um, so it's very hard for me to allow myself to, to, to write sort of basic things. So, I, so there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of lines that I just won't let myself write. My, I won't let myself write them. I love music. I love all kinds of music and I listen to all kinds of music and play all kinds of music. But, um, you know, I'm like, that's why I love so many pop songs. It's because it's like, I, there's just no way I would ever write that. Like I could never write a sentence that basic, you know, or sing a line that, that basic. So, um, and then, uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's probably one of the biggest things that's out of the question for me. And I actually, what I love about this, what I would love about this question is in answering it, you really see where your limitations are, where you're putting the glass ceiling on yourself, right? And so actually one, this is a topic that I've been talking about to my own life coach is this idea of like, okay, if you won't let yourself write that kind of music, then you have to go write that kind of music to just like free yourself of that. Yes, yes actually we had, um, I was part of a, uh, an improv group in, in Chelsea a long time ago. Mm -hmm. And the woman who ran it, uh, you know, the musical improv, and she absolutely refused the, to allow the, uh, the accompanist who was a musical improv as well. Yep. Uh, he, he was not allowed under any circumstances to start any song with da, 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 da. <laughs> <laughs> and just, so, uh, so to transition that, what is your strangest experience? One of the strangest experiences I've ever had was in, was I was hiking in Maine. The, the two most, two of the most strangest experiences happened to me in nature. So the first one was I was hiking in Maine and it was a very, in Acadia National Park, and it was sort of early morning, very uh, cloudy, misty, kind of, I don't know, Maine-y weather, kind of foggy, you know. Yep. Um, and I, lo I was looking through the forest. I was on this path, and I was looking through the forest, and I saw what looked like just some some clouds like the fog bank basically you know some low hanging clouds and as the, as i got closer and closer and closer i realized it was the it was the edge or the side of a huge like cliff and it was just I, it was very hard to describe but it was that uh what i thought was a cloud was actually like a mountain you know mm -hmm. um and it was just this very weird disconnect like I just thought oh I'm just walking on this path into this fog bank and and then when I get closer and closer I realize it's the edge of a giant cliff face and I don't know. yeah it was a very strange experience and then the second one was similar I was backpacking with my partner in Wyoming and we were many days into a trip and in the Wind River Range in Wyoming and we had gotten up we were moving that day, you know, camp, moving camp that day. And we had gone down to the edge of this lake to fill up our water bottles. And I don't know, there's some, there was something about the, the lake was entirely still and the clouds in the sky were reflected perfectly in the lake such that you looked into the lake and it looked like you were peering over the sky. It was, it was, it was, nuts i mean it looked like i was standing upside down basically is is a sort of it is much more spiritual than that but it was a very i've never experienced anything like that like i if you didn't know that your feet were on the ground i would have thought my feet were upside down and i was standing on the sky it was very strange 
So those are the two strangest experiences I've ever had. They're beautiful. They're, I go, they're mysterious. And um, I think about them a lot. They were, they're very, they stand out to me in my mind and give me a lot of joy. Uh, what is your baseline criteria for satisfaction? Uh, acceptance, letting go, and not taking anything personally. And uh, uh, that's a lot of, that comes with a lot of learning. <laughs> I can say that now after a lot of living and a lot of studying Zen philosophy and with my Zen teacher, but acceptance and letting go and not taking things personally, I think. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, what is your abiding passion? What do you care about most? Mm. Um, I care about being in the present while I'm here. Uh, I care about being you know, in the present with other people and being really, you know, open to them and not being distracted. Um, and I care about, um, I mean, since the experience with my mom, I, I, I have really carried, cared, I have really cared about being ready to die. I mean, that experience has changed my whole perspective about life and making sure that once she, once I had my time to myself, that I became okay with that, that reality and said what I needed to say to everybody that I needed to say it to and everybody that's, that needs to know how I felt about them or how they helped me or changed my life. Now they all know that. So since my mom died, I've kind of been on a, a pa uh, I had a sort of checklist, so to speak of things I needed to do and say to people. And, you know, I have a plan for, for how, it, you know, my, what my funeral will be or, you know, where, where my journals should go and these kinds of things. So, so that I don't have to, that doesn't scare me anymore. And, um, yeah. Okay. Uh, that's pretty cool. cool. Can I ask you what, what you're, what you're wearing around your neck? Yeah. I'm wearing, uh, first, a little, I don't know, these two little pieces of silver that say, it's a quote, a quotation by, Gertrude Stein that says, let me listen to me and not to them. Okay. <laughs> Which I love. And uh, the other one, the other two are, one is a spiral. Which I is, that. Yeah, often thought of as, you know, inner to outer transformation. It's a, it's a symbol of transformation. And then the other one is a little symbol for alchemy. Um, so, you know, another form of transformation of turning something you know, from one state to another. So creation, basically. Um, so like yours, I use them to remind me. I mean, I love the the Gertrude Stein quote. It's just so great. Let me listen to me and not to them. It's just, you know, <laughs> I mean, all my heroes have some version of, all my heroes say some version of that line, you know, Thoreau, uh, Gandhi, you know, like everybody we love, Martin Luther King. So everybody has a version of that. So I just love that. And the other two are like yours to just remind me of, you know, transformation and creation, basically. Yeah, just little yeah. little reminders. A reminder. Growth and change and, and, and just, just uh, uh, for, you know, uh, well-being. Uh, yeah. In college, uh, for a year, the writer Jamaica, Jamaica Kincaid lived in the faculty apartment next to mine. And I love her writing. She's an amazing, amazing writer. And she had a saying that was, everything is deeply perishable. You know, like, like 
I mean, I, I just made this new record, which we haven't even talked about, but we'll talk about it a little bit. Sure. Um, you know, like, yeah, I poured my heart and soul into these songs that were really a gift to my mom. And, you know, and, and then I made, poured my heart and soul into making the record with an incredible cast of musicians and producers and et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, and then I die. And like, it's just, it's just like all you, you can just put it out there. You know, everything is deeply perishable. It's, we're just at, back to our conversation about the grain of sand in the ocean. You know, we're just a blip. Yeah. All you can do is just try your best to be a good person. You know, I tell people try to get out of your own way and try to get out of other people's way. <laughs> yeah. What do you want to be better at? Jazz improvisation. Yeah. Always, always working on that. Always want to be a better songwriter. Try to write a better song. I want to write more songs. Um, I want to be better at being present. I want to be better at painting and drawing. I mean, because so now I do more of that in my life, and I'm always want to be better at that. Uh, I want to be a better friend. I want to be a better partner. I want to be um, more full of joy all the time. That's something I'm working on. Okay. Yeah. If you want to be joyful, be joyful. So I'm working yeah. on being joyful. Yeah. It's the, uh, the statement that uh, it's often attributed to Abraham Lincoln, and, and I, I don't think we've ever verified it, but you're only as happy as you make your mind up to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> uh, um, so I'm going to get to the last of the questions and then we can talk a little bit about your album. But mm -hmm. um, if you could throw it all away and be a rock star, astronaut, movie star, firefighter, bartender in paradise. Uh, I would probably be a Zen monk in a monastery high up in the mountains. <laughs> yeah, that's it. For right. I mean, that's my answer today. Ask me tomorrow and it might be something different, but. I mean, my other fantasy is a uh, is a living in a little trapper's hut in the Arctic. Really? I, yeah, I I read a book. Uh, I like to read about solitude and silence, and so I was reading all these books about solitude and silence. And I read, I heard, I saw mentioned a book called A Woman in the Polar Night, which is a memoir about a uh, German mother in I think between the wars who basically whose husband was in Svalbard which is above Norway I know uh, this. Oh, yeah. yeah and uh, he was doing research up there and she decided to go visit him and spend the year with him and of course at that time like women didn't do that and so the the memoir is about her time with him living in a little 10 by 10 trapper's shack with his hunting partner. And it's an incredible book. Um, and I read this and it totally lit my mind on fire and I really had to go to the Arctic. And so when after my mom died, I figured out a way to go to the Arctic. And did, you go, did you go to Svalbard? Yeah, I went to Svalbard. And it's it's I, like the most northernmost inhabited place in the world, I think. Correct. Right? Yeah, I went on an artist residency program where we got on a boat, a ship, a three-masted sailing ship, and really? yeah, and sailed up the western corner, northwestern corner of the of the island, and um, yeah, it was with other like twenty other artists. It was an amazing experience. I was the only musician, obviously, because not a lot of musicians take their instruments into such like weather like that, but. That is my other fantasy. It's um, it's such an incredible landscape and amazing place. And that book just lit me on fire. And basically, now I'm trying to figure out how to get back there. Really? I'd like to go live up there and do and like write a write a write a record, like live in a little cabin up there and write a write a write a piece of music about the about it. Yeah, it's an amazing. It's amazing. It's um, it's amazing, and it's also devastating to think of what's happening. To the Arctic. Yeah. Um, so, anyway, that's my other fantasy. 
Wow. Be, to be a woman in the polar night or a Zen monk in a, in a, in a mountain, mountain somewhere, on a mountain somewhere. Yeah. So anyway, so I, I, I'd like to hear some more about the, the album and the project because sure. about, you're, you're talking about your, your experience and your experience with your mom. Yeah. So as I said earlier, I mean, I, you know, I was able to sort of, I had enough wits about me to write down things that I wanted to write songs about as I was going through this experience with her. And, um, you know, so when I had breaks in her care, like when she was in remission, I would go to other, I went to a couple of artist residencies and, and worked on some songs. And then of course, once she died and I got back to New York and had time to really sit down and, and really make some headway on this music. Um, I did. And so I wrote about, I mean, I wrote about 30 songs, but about 17 or 16 of them were um, about this experience with her. And then, and she heard a bunch of them before she died. And Oh, very nice. Yeah, the story I tell is that, um, you know, my mom always felt really guilty and really ashamed of getting cancer. And I, I don't think that's uncommon for, for people who get a, sort of life limiting illness, you know, they feel as though they're being a burden on the family and, and, you know, she was, she was always just very, she was always a very, she was always the person who took charge and took care of people. And so to be, to have that role flipped was re really difficult for her. And, you know, no matter how many times I tried to tell her, this is my choice. I'm here. I want to be here. This is what I want to be doing. I wouldn't, I couldn't physically be anywhere else. I mean, there's just, this wasn't even a decision. It was just a, yeah. a magnetism. <laughs> um, uh, you know, it never sunk in. And so one of the first songs I wrote was a song um, called Nothing I Won't Bear that just really said that to her, but through melody and lyrics, you know. And as soon as I came home from the residency where I wrote that and played it for her, she heard it one time. I mean, of course, she was weeping and crying and so moved. She and I never had to have that conversation ever again. I mean, it was just, she got it. Yeah, she got it. So uh, finished writing those songs, started uh, looking for a producer, found an amazing guy named Rob Mounsey, who's just an incredible producer, uh, arranger. He's, his discography is, makes your mouth drop open. Um, and he and I started working on this music together and, and putting together the band that would record it. And we did it here in New York with just an incredible cast of musicians, um, they're just amazing all of them and backup singers and string section and all this kind of stuff anyway the project is called um bright nowhere it is done uh, been holding it close to my chest um looking for the right time to release it and but there's songs songs are available to hear on spotify and itunes and a bunch on my website um and yeah it's all about this journey um, of loss and uh, the landscape around loss and what it means to, I like to use this phrase of Christopher Hitchens, uh, live dyingly, basically. Um, but like I said, it's, I was very careful when I was writing it. You know, yes, I, had a, I wanted to write about death, but I knew that I wanted, the, I wanted to make an impact. And to do that, I, every song couldn't be a downer. You know, it couldn't be melancholy. It couldn't be... Um, you know, something that you only listen to when you were terribly sad. So a lot of the songs on there, you know, if you didn't know I was talking about death, I might be talking about something else. So um, super excited about it. We're planning. It, it's a long album. I mean, 17 songs is a lot of songs in this day and age. So yes. we're, yeah, we're planning on right now. The thought is that we'll put it out in three, like in as a, as three, four songs records, you know, three, four song EPs or so, um, and save some songs for a, a full length release at some point. So 
but uh, yeah, that's what I've been working on. And so I've been collaborating and doing things with people that are reimagining this space of loss and grief, which there's a lot of, a lot of that is going on in this day and age, you know, right now, I think the the wave is kind of cresting of, Oh, you know, we can actually like think a lot about death and prepare for it. And that, that makes us live a, a fuller life. Yeah. It start, I think it started with a, a Atal Gawande's book, Being Mortal. It was kind of the first, maybe one of the first recent clar- clarion calls, you know, and now there's a lot of, there's a big, there's a big conference called End Well. And there's, there's a lot of things going on in this space and in the hospice space. Yeah. And, you know, as of course, uh, you know, the aging population dealing with right. mortality. You know, yeah. So yeah. This, this, this comes into a lot sharper view for a lot of people. Mm-hmm. Because uh, you know, there's so many people have to deal with uh, the passing of uh, so many, uh, so many of loved ones, and uh, obviously, we're in the midst of it right now. We have to acknowledge that we're in the middle of the pandemic, and you know, and t- the the death toll in, of New York City alone is so staggering. I mean, it's it's incomprehensible. We've you and I have never lived through something with this you know this amount of death going on and the thing about it is if i've been reading i've been reading gothamist is uh, mm. uh the, the the anecdotal evidence from the emts are saying that they would normally get 60 or 70 heart attacks a day and uh you know they weren't all fatal mm. now they have 200 heart attacks a day and 120 of them are fatal right. and those are being counted because these people are dying at home mm-hmm. so Effectively double the number of people who are actually dying from mm-hmm. this. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, you know, uh, and I made the joke several weeks ago to somebody on Facebook. I said, you know, there's that joke about um, going to Starbucks and you see somebody sitting there, not on a phone, not on a laptop, not on a tablet, just drinking a coffee, and like like a psychopath. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 now it's like anytime you see anybody with not wearing gloves and a mask, you go, what the hell's the matter with you? You're out of here, mm-hmm. you know. And basically. Mm-hmm. This, and, and, and this is life or death. And, yeah. And getting this. There's no time to be cavalier. And I don't care what your opinion is. Just out of the social convention. Just do it. Just for the sake. Yeah, just for us. Just for all of us. Yeah. yeah. Just, please. Just, just have mm-hmm. a little. Reassures people somewhat. At the very mm-hmm. tiniest little level. Mm-hmm. But, yeah. yeah. So it's it's been, you know, I've, I've been going around um, playing this music for at house concerts for people who have lost loved ones. And that's an incredible experience to have a small group of, of people listening to these songs. And we usually get into a big discussion about loss and what it's, what it was like for them. I've played it at a um, cancer support communities center, which, you know, facilitates uh, support groups for cancer patients. And that was incredible. Um, so I'm looking to do more of these collaborations and we're currently setting them up. I, I did a, a TED talk, a TEDx talk called uh, Grief Casserole, which is all about how to help your friends and family through um, loss. And uh, that's been amazing. That's, that's, that's opened a lot of doors for me to help to talk about this issue. And, you know, I, I really conceive of the songs as like a message in a bottle. Um, my experience was that, Nobody, I, I felt very alone caring for my mom um, in the sense that, you know, people don't want to, people don't want to do the wrong thing. They never, they don't want to, they, they want to help, but they, they get in their own way because they think, oh, I don't, I don't want to bother her. You know, yeah. I'm sure she doesn't want another person offering to help or, and, and, you know, there's, there's many ways that, in which I felt alone. And, and what I feel like people just need is sort of a little script that helps them reach out to their friend or their family member who's going through loss. And, this, and I, I envision the songs as, a, as that, like a little, a little message in a bottle, like maybe I don't know what the right thing to say is because very few people do when faced with loss. But I could send you this song and say, you know, I'm thinking about you. This made me think of you and what you're going through with your mom. Or this this song made me think of you. And you know, on your I know this was the day your dad died last year. Um, so for me, I'm I'm looking to open up the conversation 
to give people away. And music is such a great way to do that because it, it carries so much more with it besides just the words, you know. Just by, you know, accomplishing this, you, you, you're able to, you are able to do that, you know. Yeah. So you just, you, yeah. you, there's a beginning, a middle, and an end, and it's, 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 it's you, you've articulated this, and, and you'd be able to say, listen, this is how you can approach and, and deal with it, and, and mm-hmm. let it, you know, have it find its, its, its own place, and, but without having that uh, expressed or, or giving some of you, you're guiding people to, to, mm-hmm. to how to deal. Yeah, I love that. I love what you said there, like the beginning, the middle, the end. I mean, that's so that's so true about anything that's really hard, but it's really being able to say, you know, yeah, you're in the you're at the beginning of the beginning or you're in the middle of the middle. Oh no, you're you're at the beginning of the end, you know, <laughs> you're at the middle of the end. You know, th- those kinds of um things and and being able to help somebody through any of those parts is just a gift. It's a gift. As I say with everybody, um, I thank you so much for, for your time. And uh, I've had a great experience. And um, <laughs> I always say, so we're going to end this by saying, as I always do, uh, uh, thanks for listening. And as the kitties say, peace out. <laughs> thanks so much for having me, Tim. It was, it was fantastic. Yeah.